I am a Canadian journalist. I'm not a scientist. I don't have any scientific background. So I have um, looked at the IPCC as an organization. And I have written two books now on the IPCC. And the interesting thing is that when I began researching climate change five years ago, so is everything okay? When I began researching climate change five years ago, I had never heard of this organization before that writes the Climate Bible. I had no idea that governments all around the world were telling their citizens that the reason we should believe that there's a climate crisis is because the IPCC says so. I had no idea that new laws, new taxes, and massive changes to energy systems were all being justified by governments by pointing to the work of this particular organization, the great IPCC. So this is my first book about the IPCC. A German translation has been published by IKEA. And I'm very happy to tell you that all of you here today have received a German language copy of my book in your package, in your blue bag. In this book, I explain that many of the things that we've been told about the IPCC are not, in fact, true. Let's start with the claim that this is a collection of the world's top scientists and best experts. This is Rajanda Pachori. He has been the chairman of the IPCC for 14 years. When journalists ask him who writes IPCC reports, this is the sort of thing he says. He says, these are people who have been chosen on the basis of their track record, on their record of publications, on the research that they have done, these are people who are at the top of their profession. But I discovered something rather different. Some of the key people at the IPCC, lead authors and people who are in charge of IPCC chapters, have in fact been mere graduate students. Students who are a decade or more away from earning their PhD. So Richard Klein, who is a geography professor from the Netherlands, became an IPCC lead author in 1994 at the tender age of 25. Three years later, he was promoted and he became the head of a chapter for the IPCC. But it was only in 2003 that he earned his PhD. Lawrence Bauer became an IPCC lead author in 1999. He hadn't even got his master's degree yet. That happened two years later. And Sari Kovats in 1994 was one of only 21 people in the entire world whom the IPCC thought was expert enough to help it write its very first chapter on how climate change might affect human health. But she wasn't chosen because of her extensive publication record, because her very first academic paper wasn't published until three years after that. She received her PhD in 2010, finally, 16 years after she became involved with the IPCC. These people are not at the top of their profession. They are not even close to being leading scientists. Here's Chairman Pachori again. In 2008, he addressed a committee of the North Carolina State Legislature. And here's what he told those lawmakers. He says, we carry out our assessment of climate change based on peer-reviewed literature so that everything we look at and take into account has to carry the credibility 
of peer-reviewed publications. We don't settle for anything less than that. Well, it turns out that this is nonsense too. A few years ago, I asked readers of my blog for help. 40 volunteers from 12 countries helped me examine the references listed at the end of each of the chapters in the 2007 IPCC report, and there were 44 chapters. We sorted these references into two categories, articles published in peer review academic journals and everything else. And the results were shocking. 5,600 sources listed by the IPCC had not been published in peer-reviewed journals. 30%. Now, it may be that some of those sources were legitimate. It may have made sense for the IPCC to rely on them. But that doesn't change the fact that the IPCC's chairman has made profoundly untrue statements. For years, he insisted that everything the IPCC considers had been peer-reviewed beforehand, and that IPCC reports were credible for that reason. He is the one who declared the IPCC doesn't settle for anything less. Now we know that 30% of its source material was not peer-reviewed, what are we supposed to think? In that same 2007 report, the IPCC chose to rely on a document produced by an activist group called the World Wildlife Fund, the WWF. That document claimed that Himalayan glaciers were in danger of disappearing by the year 2035. The IPCC took the WWF's word for it and published that claim in its report. Later, it admitted that this glacier prediction was wrong, profoundly, embarrassingly, utterly wrong. So what did the IPCC learn from that experience? Did it conclude that it's a bad idea to rely on information produced by activist groups? Did it forbid its personnel from citing activist literature as evidence? I'm afraid not. Here are chapters two and chapters four from the working group two section of the brand new IPCC report. These chapters were released two weeks ago. This is page 25 of chapter two. The sole evidence the IPCC cites for a claim about Arctic ecosystems is a 2012 document authored by Christie and Summercorn. This is page 58 from chapter four. Once again, the IPCC's only evidence for a statement about the Arctic is Christie and Summercorn. But Christie and Summercorn is not peer-reviewed science, published in a reputable academic journal. Christie and Summercorn is actually a WWF document it's the same group responsible for the Himalayan glacier mistake. Now, the WWF is an activist organization. It has an agenda. It does not produce objective information. The WWF raises hundreds of millions of euros every year by declaring the sky is falling. We're on the brink of ecological collapse. Send money now. So why does the IPCC continue to take the WWF's word for it? Why does it not have a policy forbidding its personnel from relying on this kind of material? Now this is a graphic I took from the internet. It has nothing to do with climate change. 
<laughs> it's one of those images that people pass around on the internet, like on Facebook. And the reason that we share it and it speaks to us is because it reminds us that ordinary people in the real world, we learn from our mistakes. We take steps to ensure that it doesn't happen again. The IPCC made a choice. Today, in 2014, it chooses to treat activist publications as reliable evidence. Why? After five years of research, I think I have the answer to that question and that it's a simple answer, if a disturbing answer. The IPCC is an elaborate illusion. And it is an illusion that is so effective that many of the people involved sincerely buy into this illusion. They believe it. Here is how the IPCC describes itself on its website. In a few paragraphs, the word scientific appears six times. Scientists are also mentioned. This is the illusion. Over and over again, we're told that what goes on at the IPCC is science. Indeed, the first sentence in paragraph two is explicit. It declares, the IPCC is a scientific body. But an organization is not a scientific body simply because scientists are involved. A baseball team made up of scientists is not a scientific body. It's a baseball team. A chess club whose members happen to be scientists is not a scientific body. It's a chess club. Let's take a look at that last sentence in paragraph two. That's where the IPCC admits it does not conduct any research. No science actually takes place at the IPCC. The IPCC's job is to write reports. Its personnel are supposed to survey already existing scientific research and write a report about what that research says. In the process, a great deal of human judgment is involved. Fallible human judgment. IPCC personnel decide that some studies are worth paying attention to and that others belong in the dustbin. They decide that certain still unproven assumptions deserve to be taken seriously, but not other unproven assumptions. <coughs> Judgment calls are not science. They are relying on their knowledge of scientific matters, but IPCC personnel are actually playing a role similar to jurors at a trial. When a jury evaluates evidence and draws conclusions, no one calls that science. Judgment calls. If the IPCC isn't doing science, it's not a scientific body. It's an organization that writes reports, which would be fine if it wasn't also an organization on a mission. This is the front cover of an IPCC brochure from its meeting in Yokohama two weeks ago. Notice the IPCC logo down there on the bottom. This is not a parody. This is not an image created by a critic to make fun of the IPCC. This is real. The IPCC thinks it's in the business of delivering hope for our Earth. It thinks its job is to save the planet. Now on page two of that brochure, 
we find this lovely paragraph with its heading, Save the Planet for Future Generations. I'm just going to give you a minute to read that. We must bequeath to future generations. Now what I, or you, owe to future generations is a philosophical question. It may be a moral and spiritual question, but it is not something that science can answer. So you see, the IPCC, it wants it both ways. On its website, it talks about science, science, science. But that's just the illusion. In reality, the people at the IPCC have another agenda. They think it's their job to decide philosophical matters, what we owe future generations. And if they're making those kinds of decisions, that means that the rest of us have been excluded from the discussion of what we owe future generations. That's anti-democratic. The small group of people at the IPCC have no right to make the decision for all of us of what we owe future generations. <laughs> what we see here in this brochure is the illusion of science being used to advance a philosophical position. We must bequeath certain things to future generations. So who else is obsessed with future generations and taking action? What do you know? Activist groups like the WWF, they like to talk about future generations. The IPCC says it is a scientific body, but it behaves like an activist organization. And that is the reason that we should not trust the IPCC. Whether we are members of the public, whether we are working scientists or government officials, we should not take advice from the IPCC. This is not a credible scientific organization. Rather than sticking to science, the IPCC gives us activism. Thank you for your attention.